Welcome to this very first basic lecture about nonlinear regression. We will first see the difference between linear and nonlinear regression, and how to fit a polynomial and exponential function to some data. Then we will have a look at the method of least squares, and how to use nonlinear regression in R. Finally, we will discuss local versus global minima. In previous videos, we have used linear regression to fit a straight line to the data. This is appropriate if there is a linear relationship between the variables x and y. However, in the case where there is a nonlinear relationship between x and y, a straight line will not be appropriate to fit to the data. We can then instead use nonlinear regression, or we identify an appropriate nonlinear function for the data so that we instead can fit the curve to the data. As an example, we'll here fit a nonlinear model to data from a study where one has injected a drug into a patient's blood and then measure the concentration of the drug every 20 minutes. If you plot the data, it is clear that the straight line is not appropriate to fit to the data. If we do not know what kind of nonlinear function we should use to fit to the data, we could use, for example, a second degree polynomial or a third degree polynomial. By using, for example, a second degree polynomial, we can use the curve to predict, for example, the drug concentration in the blood at 30 minutes. By eyeballing the curve, we can see that the drug concentration is about 70 mg per liter after 30 minutes. When we fit the second degree polynomial, the parameters will be estimated to these values. By using them all with the estimated parameters, we can make a more accurate prediction if we set t to 30 in the equation and do the math, which will result in a more accurate prediction rather than eyeballing the curve. Although polynomials can be used to predict the value of y, these estimated parameters are usually useless to make predictions about the system. For example, what does this value tell us about the drug? Also, the curve will go up like this if we continue to plot it. This does not reflect the fact that the drug concentration should approach zero. This kind of model does not explain anything about the system. It is only useful to predict the value of y for a certain value of x. The aim of these kinds of studies is usually to estimate the elimination rate and the volume distribution. This kind of equation cannot be used to help us estimate such parameters. To come up with an appropriate nonlinear function, we need to have some knowledge about the system. One simple function that might explain how the drug concentration in the blood changes over time is the function of exponential decay that we have discussed in the previous video. If we fit this function to the data, we see that it fits very well. The value of y0 is here estimated 146.4, which is the value of the curve at time point 0. This value represents the initial concentration of the drug in the blood after the drug has been injected. If we know the drug dose that has been injected, we can estimate the volume of distribution which is the theoretical volume in which the drug is distributed in. Suppose that we have injected 1000 mg of the drug. Then we see that we can estimate the volume of distribution to about 6.83 liters. The value of K, which is the elimination rate constant, has been estimated to 0 0.029. This can be interpreted as approximately 2.9% of the drug is eliminated from the body per minute. As we discussed in the video about the exponential decay, the half-life of the drug can be calculated as the natural log of 2 divided by the elimination rate constant. If we plug in the values and do the math, we can see that the half-life of the drug is estimated to 23.9 minutes, which means that the time point when half of the drug has been eliminated is equal to 23.9 minutes. So, how do we get these parameter values when we use nonlinear regression? In comparison to linear regression, where we can estimate the parameters by hand through some math, 
That is not possible in nonlinear regression. To estimate the parameters in nonlinear regression, we need to use numerical computations. The method of least squares can be used to estimate the parameters given that the data is normally distributed, whereas the maximum likelihood method can be used to estimate the parameters for a range of different distributions. In a previous video, we worked through the method of ordinary least squares with a simple example, and in another video, we compare the ordinary least squares with the maximum likelihood method. I will therefore only go through the basics of least squares. Remember that the distance between the curve and the observation is called a residual, or an error. The residuals are calculated by taking the observed values, minus the fitted values, which are the corresponding values of the curve. Suppose that the observed y value of this observation is equal to 10, and that the value of the curve at the same x coordinate as the observation is equal to 8. Then the residual is equal to 2. Let's place the first residual here. Then we calculate the second residual in the same way. Note that this residual is negative because the data point is below the curve. Then we calculate the third residual and so forth. We then square the residuals. So we get the squared residuals. Then we sum the squared residuals so that we get the sum of the squared residuals, or sum of squared errors, SSE. The sum of the squared errors is calculated by the following equation, where we sum the squared residuals, which are the differences between observed values and the fitted values according to the curve. If we go back to our previous example, where we estimated the two parameters to these values, then the sum of the squared residuals is equal to about 36. Suppose that we would reduce the elimination rate to 0 0.02. Then we see that the curve does no longer fit well with the data, because the observed elimination rate is faster than what is predicted by the curve. The sum of the squared errors has now increased from 36 to 1531 simply because the data points are now much further away from the curve. Suppose that we increase the value of k to 0 0.04, then we see that the observed elimination is slower compared to what is predicted by the curve. The sum of the squared errors is equal to about 777. Let's say that we will plot how the sum of the squared errors changes as a function of k. We know that when k is equal to 0 0.02, the sum of the squared errors is 1531. When k is equal to 0 0.029, the sum of the squared errors is equal to 36. And when k is equal to 0 0.04, the sum of the squared errors is equal to 777. If we would generate a range of different values of k, and calculate the sum of the squared errors for each value of k, then we could generate the following curve. We see that the value of k that results in the lowest possible sum of squared errors is 0 0.029. This explains why nonlinear regression would result in the following estimated value of the elimination rate for this example dataset. We could use the same method to find the value of y0 that results in the lowest sum of squared errors. If you use the software to estimate the parameters, the software will search in a three-dimensional space to find the combination of the two parameters that results in the lowest sum of square errors. This is how the method of least squares works. It finds the optimal values of the parameters, which results in the lowest possible sum of square errors, because the curve is then as close as possible to the data points. One simple method to find the local minimum is the gradient descent method that I will cover in the next video. We'll now see how to compute nonlinear regression in R, which is a free software tool that you can download from the following website. We first start to create two vectors including the time points for the measurements and the concentrations on the drug in the blood. Note that the names of the vectors are decided by the user. 
which means that you can use other names here. Then we make a data frame out of the two vectors. Then we compute nonlinear regression with the function NLS, where we plug in the function of exponential decay. We put the y data on the left hand side of the equation, and the time points here, which correspond to the variable t in the equation. Then we put the data frame here. The aim is to estimate the parameters y0 and k of this equation. In comparison to linear regression, nonlinear regression requires that we guess starting values of the parameters that we like to estimate. Remember that we previously generated the following curve of how the sum of the squared errors changed with different values of k. The analyst function will find the value of k, which results in the lowest sum of squared errors, but it requires that we specify where we should start from. If you start at 0 0.06, the algorithm will first set the value of k to 0 0.06, then analyze if you should increase or decrease the value of k to reduce the sum of the squared errors. Since reducing the value of k will reduce the sum of the squared errors, it will go in this direction, like this, until it finds the value of k that results in the lowest sum of squared errors. If you instead happen to guess the initial value of k to 0 0.02, the algorithm will instead increase the value of k until it finds the value of k that results in the smallest possible sum of squared errors. If we print the output of the object m, we will find the estimated values of y0 and k, as well as their residual sum of squares. This explains why the method will estimate the value of k to about 0 0.029, because that is the value that results in the lowest possible sum of squared errors. If you start with the value of 0 0.1, k will still be estimated to the exact same value. However, if you start with the value further away, the method might fail to converge. This will result in that no parameters can be estimated. For more complicated nonlinear functions, there might also exist several minima, which complicates things even further. In this example, we have three minima. The point at which the function has the minimum sum of squared errors is called the global minimum, whereas these points are called local minima. Suppose that the function of the sum of the squared errors for a range of different values of k would look like this. If we would for example guess the initial value of k to 0 0.02, then the function would estimate the value of k to 0 0.029, which would result in the best fit to the data. Similarly, if we would guess the initial value of k to 0 0.034, then the method would also estimate the value of k to 0 0.029 and we would get the same nice fit with the exact same estimated value of k. But if we instead would initially guess the value of k to 0 0.036 or to 0 0.06, that would result in that the method would estimate the value of k to 0 0.04, which would result in a bad fit. If we would guess the value of k to 0 0.07, the value of k would be estimated to 0 0.064, which means that we will get an even worse fit to the data. To make sure that we find the global minimum that results in that the model fit best to the data, we need to try many different initial guesses of our parameters and select the estimated parameters that result in the lowest possible sum of squared errors. One option is to use the following package, where we can, for example, try 1000 different sets of parameter values drawn from a uniform distribution in the given ranges. For example, we can try 1000 different initial guesses of y0 drawn from a uniform distribution from 0 to 1000. Although we can now define a range, we still need to have a good idea about the parameter values because if you use a wider range of k, the method might due to chance not find the global minimum. 
It is therefore good if we have some idea about the reasonable range of initial values we should try so that our initial guesses are relatively close to the parameter values that result in the lowest possible sum of squared errors. To come up with good initial guesses for a reasonable range, let's first plot the data and imagine a curve like this. We see that y is zero, which is the value of y when time is equal to zero, seems to be around 150. 150 therefore seems to be an appropriate initial guess of y is zero. Since we know that the value of k is equal to the natural log of 2 divided by the half-life, we can try to estimate the half-life, which is the time point when half of the drug has been eliminated. If we plug in this estimated half-life in the equation and do the math, we see that a good initial guess of k should be around 0 0.03. We therefore plug in our initial values and run, which will result in the best possible parameter values of y0 and k. To generate a nice plot where we add the curve that represents the exponential decay function based on the estimated values of y0 and k, we first create a vector with time points that cover the range that we like to draw the curve in. Then we extract the estimated parameter values from the output with the function coev. Then we calculate the fitted y values of the function based on the time vector we just created and the estimated parameters we extracted from the output. Then we draw a blue curve with the function lines. To avoid extracting coefficients like this to generate the y data, we can instead use the predict function, which will generate the same fitted values of the curve as the previous code. The default method in the NLS function is the Gauss Newton method, which we will discuss in another lecture. By using the following package, one can try other methods if the NLS function failed to converge. Finally, we have a look at an example of why we should avoid transforming the data. Since our data is assumed to fall in simple exponential decay, one might argue that it is possible to log the data and then estimate the corresponding parameters with linear regression based on the log data. However, the problem with this approach is that transforming data might result in strange residuals that violate the underlying assumptions in linear regression. To illustrate this, I have here fitted a nonlinear model to the following data. We can see that the data points have an equal spread around the fitted curve. If you make a histogram of the residuals, we see that they appear to be normally distributed. This indicates that the data points have a normal distribution around the curve, which means that we fulfill the normality assumption. The variation of the data points around the curve seems to be constant since the residuals have a constant spread over time. This means that we also fulfill the assumption of homogeneity. If we instead would log the y data and fit a straight line to the log data, we see that the spread around the line is relatively big here. If we analyze the distribution of the residuals, we see that they no longer appear to be normally distributed and the variance does no longer appear to be constant, which means that we violate the assumption of homogeneity. The assumptions of normality and homogeneity needs to be fulfilled if we like to make inferences about the parameters. This example shows why we should use nonlinear regression for this example data. This was the end of this basic video about nonlinear regression. In future videos, we'll have a look at other nonlinear models and see how we can compare models to identify the most likely model. Thanks for watching.